All right, uh, welcome back, folks, to a nice lecture on the cardiovascular system. So let's talk about some human biology. Uh, this is a, a neat one. Like I, I really enjoy this. The discussions on the heart and the blood vessels are really cool. However, this is kind of a longer lecture, so I'm going to try and break it up into two parts. So what you can expect is like the first half of this is going to be on kind of on the heart and the vessels, and the second half is going to be on the blood. So what I would do if I were you is I would do the first half, and then take a break, and then another time, do the second half. That's, at least that's, that's how I would do it. All right. Um, so let's go here. <clears throat> the cardiovascular system includes the heart and blood vessels. Heart and blood vessels. Not what's flowing through them necessarily. All right. The, the, the um, blood itself is a connective tissue that is associated. At least that's the way I view it. So what does the cardiovascular system do for us? Well, it brings nutrients and oxygen nutrients and oxygen to our cells and the cells use those nutrients the cells use that oxygen and then they release waste products so the waste products go into the bloodstream uh, this would be like carbon dioxide or, or nitrogenous waste products from the breakdown of certain nutrients or what have you any waste product produced by the cells go into the bloodstream to be carried back around the body to be cleansed so what the blood really does is it's the system of conveyance. What the cardiovascular system really does is it pumps the blood as a system of conveyance to bring uh, things that the cells need to the cells, be those nutrients or oxygen or what have you, and to take away things that the cells need rid of. So, um, oh man, I imagine this is a weird example, but imagine this almost like a nurse in a hospital, right? Uh, these people, the, these assistants come in, they bring you the things that you need while you're there, and they take away anything you need to get rid of. That is the cardiovascular system. That is the blood. All right. Now, the blood is then in turn cleaned and refreshed at the lungs, the kidneys, the intestines, and the liver. Now, let me explain this. So, uh, blood cycles all around the body, and it goes to the lungs. Right. The lungs is where the uh, blood picks up oxygen and releases carbon dioxide. Like We know that. We inhale oxygen, we exhale carbon dioxide. What's happening is the blood is coming to the lungs to drop off carbon dioxide, a waste product, and to pick up oxygen, which our cells need to then be carried all around the body to convey that oxygen. The cells then, or I'm sorry, the, the blood goes to the kidneys. Uh, the kidneys are a center of purification for the blood. They're a cleansing center. What the kidneys do mainly is they regulate uh, the blood's volume. So the amount of water in the blood uh, is dictated by the kidneys to some degree. And further, the kidneys pick up any nitrogenous waste products. These are side effects of your metabolism. So all the chemical reactions that happen in your body, uh, most of these are releasing nitrogenous waste products that can build up and cause you problems. The kidneys clean that out. All right. Uh, the intestines. So blood goes to the intestines to pick up nutrients. So the blood will go out to your cells, drop off these nutrients, those nutrients are used, and uh, then the blood goes back to the intestines to pick up new, new nutrients and then carries that out to the uh, body, to the cells. And then last but not least is the liver. The liver is a major, major cleansing center of the blood. So um, as the blood cycles around the body, it picks up certain toxins uh, that the liver then purifies. Yeah. Now, here's a point to be made. Blood always in vessels. We have what's called a closed circulatory system. A closed circulatory system. There are other animals out there, uh, insects really, there are insects mostly, uh, whom have open circulatory systems. It works kind of like the engine in a car. An open circulatory system, uh, the organism will pump blood up to the top and it trickles down over all their organs and then it's pumped back up to the top and it trickles over their organs again kind of like oiling an engine so you have an oil pan at the bottom of an engine and the oil gets pumped to the top and it kind of runs over everything on the way down but that is not at all the way our system works our blood is always within vessels um, and having exchanged via diffusion and osmosis as we will describe here in just a second Yes. All right. Uh, each minute, each minute, the whole blood volume is circulated. In other words, blood in your heart right now is going to circle all the way through the body and be back in your heart within the next minute. 
which is pretty impressive. It's very fast. All right, general functions of the cardiovascular system are as follows. To generate pressure, okay, that helps to move the blood around. It's very important. Transportation of the blood. Exchanging of nutrients and wastes at the capillaries. Capillaries. The capillaries are the smallest blood vessels, and we'll be describing them in detail here in just a few moments. And uh, let's see, last but not least, regulation of where blood goes. All right, this is going to be called vasoconstriction and vasodilation. And I think we've talked about this before, but the idea is that you can constrict your blood vessels and make them get smaller. Okay, vasoconstriction, to get smaller. And when you make the blood vessels get uh, smaller, it, it makes them less capable of transmitting blood. Uh, so by vasoconstricting a blood vessel, you can keep blood from going to a certain area. And then by comparison, vasodilation is to take a blood vessel and make it larger. If you make that blood vessel larger, more blood can go through it, and that can be conveyed to a certain area of the body more quickly or more easily. So vasoconstriction and vasodilation. All right, uh, let's talk a little bit about how the heart is situated internally. Your heart has what's called a, a serosa, or a serous membrane, called the parietal and visceral pericardia, okay? Parietal and visceral pericardium. The pericardium is a double-walled sac enclosing the heart. It is a serous membrane or a serosa. Uh, what I want you to know is that there are, again, it's a two-part system. One's called the parietal pericardium, the other's called the visceral pericardium. Parietal pericardium, the visceral pericardium. The way this works is as follows. The parietal pericardium is a very thin, uh, smooth membrane that lines the internal chamber around the heart. So in other words, if somebody's getting like a heart transplant and they take their heart out, getting ready to put another one in, when they take the heart out, the parietal pericardium is still there, surrounding the chamber where the heart would be found. The visceral pericardium is attached to the heart itself. It is on it like skin on a grape. It's attached. Uh, so you, And it's, again, very, very smooth. So you have a visceral pericardium on the heart and a pri uh, parietal pericardium that surrounds the cavity where the heart is found. Almost like this, you know, fist in a balloon situation where there's a balloon around the fist and then a balloon on the outside. Now what these do is provide a lubricated, smooth surface so that as the heart beats and does what it does, it doesn't build friction with the surrounding tissues. It's very important. All right. Um, this is a biggie, okay? This is an important one to talk about. There are several important ones as we go, but this is a very important one. Um, I'm just going to run through the basic parts of the heart right now, and um, you should pay distinct attention. All right, here we go. <clears throat> Blood comes into the heart here and here via the superior vena cava and the inferior vena cava. The blood comes in. Dude, so let me just tell you, I'm probably going to like totally jump through five or six slides right now describing this, but I, I mean, we're on video and you can rewind this and watch it a million times. I think this might be the best way to do it. All right, blood comes into the heart from the superior and inferior vena cava, coming in like so. This drains the top of the body, this drains the bottom of the body. This is, these are veins. The superior vena cava comes in from the top. The inferior vena cava comes up from the bottom. And they come in and dump blood into the atrium here. Okay, this atrium. This is going to be the right atrium. So blood fills the right atrium like a balloon. And the right atrium contracts. and sends blood down into the right ventricle. You can see this here. Right atrium, right ventricle. Okay. The right ventricle contracts, sends blood up and then out to the lungs. That blood comes back from the lungs and goes into the left atrium. Left atrium. Can't see it because the way the heart's turned here. But this is the left atrium, left atrium. Uh, the left atrium has blood that comes back from the lungs, full of oxygen and ready to go. The left atrium contracts and sends blood down to the left ventricle. And the left ventricle contracts and sends blood out to the body to be used. Now, once it's gone out to the body to be used, what happens to it? It's used, and then it's at a low oxygen state, so it comes back to the heart via the superior and inferior vena cava, which comes into the right atrium, which contracts, sends blood to the right ventricle, contracts, goes out to the lungs, back from the lungs to the uh, left atrium, which contracts, sends blood to the left ventricle, contracts, and sends blood out to the body again. So that's the cycle. That's how this works. Let's make sure we got everything we need here. Um, I'm going to point out these uh, these small arteries and veins here. 
These are what get blocked when people have a heart attack. So uh, they are very important. They actually feed the heart and provide the oxygen that the heart as a muscle needs to contract. Again, think about your arm as being mus uh, muscular and you could tourniquet your arm off with a band and after a few minutes, it would just not work anymore. It would be completely devoid of any motion. You wouldn't be able to use it because it has to have oxygen to function. The heart's the same way, it's a muscle. If it doesn't get oxygen, it doesn't work. And these are the arteries and veins that feed the muscle of the heart. So if you get a little blockage down there over here, this area of muscle is going to quit working. That's a heart attack. Okay. Uh, let's see, what else do I want to say here? Separated by a septum. You can see the septum here. Uh, you, so the, the ventricles. The ventricles are separated by a septum. You may have heard uh, that of a heart murmur. You may have heard of a heart murmur. A heart murmur is oftentimes a case where the septum has an opening in it, so uh, as the ventricles contract, blood kind of sloshes back and forth between the ventricles. Okay, that's a heart murmur. Um, two atria, two ventricles, semilunar valves, and atrioventricular valves. I'm going to point out these valves here. Okay, there are valves in place. One will be up in there, um, actually coming from back there. But anyway, uh, mainly I'm going to point out these big, what are called atrioventricular valves. Big atrioventricular valves. What will happen is, when the atria contract, they send blood down to the ventricle, and then when the ventricle contracts, these valves close, so the blood has to leave the heart instead of just sloshing back up into the atrium. So blood goes down from the atrium, the atria is closed, and then when the ventricle contracts, boom, it squeezes, and blood can't just backtrack because the valves close. In fact, uh, if you listen to someone's heartbeat, it sounds like Yes? What you're hearing is a, um, a percussive impact sound of the valves go boom, 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 boom. They're opening and closing, opening and closing, opening and closing. It's the valves that cause the heart sound. They're quite percussive. You can hear them clearly. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good way to describe it. Okay. Uh, let's see, the pulmonary circuit and the systemic circuit. So, the way that blood flows through your heart is divided into two parts, the pulmonary circuit and the systemic circuit. Anything that says pulmonary deals with the lungs, and systemic deals with the rest of the body. So basically, half your heart, the right side, is going to be responsible for the pulmonary circuit, which we already described. We said that the right ventricle contracts and sends blood out to the lungs, right? Well, that's the pulmonary circuit, carrying blood to the lungs. And then the systemic circuit, the left side of the heart, seen here, pumps blood out to the rest of the body. So, pulmonary circuit, pumps blood to the lungs to be refreshed, to pick up oxygen. That oxygenated blood comes back to the heart to run through the systemic circuit, to pump out to the body to carry oxygen where it goes. Once the systemic circuit blood has gone through the body, it's low on oxygen. So, where does it need to go? It comes back to the right side of the heart to run through the pulmonary circuit to go back to the lungs to get oxygen. That comes back to the heart to run to the left side of the heart to run through the systemic circuit to carry that oxygenated blood to wherever it needs to be. It's a constant cycle around the body to use oxygen, then back to the lungs to be refreshed, and then back out to the body to carry new oxygen. Pulmonary circuit is oxygenating blood. The systemic circuit is using that blood that has oxygen in it. And that's how this goes, man. That's how it works. Now, let me ask you a question. you got to think about this a little bit. Knowing that the right side of the heart pumps blood only to the lungs, and again, you need to consider, do I have a person anywhere around here? You need to consider that if this is the heart, the lungs are right there and right there. I mean, literally, right beside it. Right beside it. Okay? Yeah, here we go. Look up here right on top of the heart. The heart is literally encapsulated by the lungs. Is the right side of the heart, the pulmonary circuit, is that going to be working very hard? It's just literally popping blood right to the lungs and, by, and right back, right to the lungs, right back, right to the lungs and right back. It's not. This is a very simple, low pressure, easy system. Then the systemic circuit is pumping blood from the top of your head to the bottom of your toes. And because of that, the, the heart looks different, the sides of the heart. The right ventricle, look how thin that muscle is. Very, very thin. And then look at the left ventricle, super thick and muscular. Because the right ventricle just has to you know, pump a little blood to the lungs. It's no big deal. Very simple. 
But then you have the left ventricle, and it's got to really pump that blood up to the head and down to the toes and back, all right, and back. So it's really working hard. So the pulmonary circuit is very, very low pressure, very short, uh, fed by the right side of the heart. The systemic circuit is much larger, okay, much higher pressure, much higher resistance, and fed by this left ventricle. And you got to think about it as your left. So your left side of, of your heart is going to be very, very thick, and your right side, so my right, is going to be uh, very thin by comparison. Uh, and we can see this in the arteries and the veins as well to some degree. It's worthy of mention here. If you look at an, and this is very important, if you look at an artery, arteries tend to be very thick-walled and small diameter, very muscular, super muscular, man. That's, that's a lot of muscle, uh, smooth muscle in this case. And then the veins, vein shown here in blue, the veins are uh, very thin-walled, but real large in diameter. And the idea is that blood coming out of the heart, bam, goes right into the arteries, and the arteries are taking a beating, man. Like, they've got to be very strong to, to hold all that pressure that's blasting through there. And uh, once all that blood has flowed through the arteries and does what it's supposed to do, then it gets dumped into this low-pressure vein system to slowly make its way back to the heart. So the veins have this, this big diameter, they have thin walls, because the blood's literally just kind of coasting its way back to the heart. The pressure's off by the time you're in the veins. So the arteries are thick-walled and muscular, muscular to deal with high-pressure blood, and the veins are thin-walled and pretty big to deal with really low-pressure blood. Yeah, perfect. Uh, path. All right, so uh, this is how this works. What will happen is once blood leaves the heart, it goes, and I, dudes, let me tell you, you're going to be seeing this again, all right? This is going to be on your test. I can just about guarantee it. Blood flows from the heart to the arteries, arteries to arterioles, arterioles to capillaries, and capillaries are where the exchange happens. Okay, where oxygen is exchanged for carbon dioxide, where wastes are exchanged for nutrients, what have you. The capillaries are the exchange network of the body. Like you can see it here, man. Artery, okay, arterial, capillary beds. The capillary beds give massive surface area. Massive surface area for exchange. And this is incredibly important. All right, they're called capillary beds, uh, and they are infinitesimally small. So small, in fact, that red blood cells have to line up and go single file through them for exchange purposes. All right, so artery, arter, or heart to arteries, arteries to arterioles, and the arterioles are very important here because they're quite muscular. Uh, vasoconstriction and vasodilation, which we described earlier, that happens at the arterioles. Okay, so we can regulate where blood goes by regulating the arterioles. Heart to arteries. Arteries to arterioles, arterioles to capillaries where exchange happens. Uh, the capillaries lead to venules. These are little bitty veins. Okay, little bitty veins. Uh, and then the venules go to the veins. And the veins are big, you know, th uh, thin walled, large diameter, uh, blood carrying apparati that go back to the heart. But what's important about the veins, and boy do you need to know this, is that veins have valves. About 70% of the blood is found in the veins at any given period of time. And as this blood is flowing through the veins, it's at low pressure. So what we have to do is we have to have valves there so that as blood moves up, it can't backtrack. Imagine all, imagine your legs, okay? You're standing up and your heart's way up in your chest. Blood wants to go down to your feet because of gravity, but it can't do that. It has to keep constantly moving up because there are valves in place that keep that blood from being able to backtrack. You ever heard of varicose veins? And I probably have a slide on this later. Uh, but varicose veins, this is a situation where, um, uh, let me get my brain straight here, where the valves quit working. So blood just pools in the legs. And that's a real problem. Yeah, that's perfect. Okay. All right. Uh, this is a gorgeous image of the heart. So I, I took this in these following images at the Body Works, uh, body, um, Bodies Museum, Bodies uh, Exhibit, if you will, in Charlotte, North Carolina. So this is a real heart that's had the heart muscle removed and only the arterial network is left. What you see here are the big arteries and arterioles, and then this fuzz all in the background, that's all capillaries. The same thing here. Big honking arteries, uh, smaller arterioles you can see, and then the fuzz in the background, that's all capillaries. You can see my watch right there. <laughs> uh, here's a head. 
All right, I think this is where we stopped. So, uh, yay camera issues. How does blood flow, the, flow through the heart? We've already done this. Um, let me just run you through it one more good time. So we have this superior and inferior vena cava. Okay, superior and inferior vena cava. They channel blood into the right atrium. The right atrium contracts and sends blood to the right ventricle. The right ventricle contracts, sends blood out to the lungs to pick up oxygen. It's pulmonary circuit. Comes back to the left atrium, which contracts, sends blood to the left ventricle, which contracts, and sends blood out to the body to use oxygen. That blood then comes back via the superior and inferior vena cava to the left, I'm sorry, wrong, to the right atrium, the right atrium. So pulmonary circuit, um, um, systemic circuit, pulmonary systemic, pulmonary systemic. Body uses the oxygen, the lungs provide the oxygen. And uh, that's how that works. I will have her point out one more thing, and that is the aorta. Uh, the aorta seen here, the aorta is uh, the major artery. Now, this is so important. The aorta is the highest pressure artery in the body. Like when the, the left ventricle contracts, it is violent. Okay, It is a violent compression, man. And it really pushes extraordinarily high pressure blood zapping into the aorta. And the aorta then has to deal with that extreme pressure. It's very huge, man. It's thick and powerful and strong. It deals with all that pressure and then sends blood all around the body. So the aorta is the first big artery coming up off of the um, above, up off of the heart. Like for, I'll give you a for instance. So the first two branches off the aorta are your carotid arteries. So you see these horror movies and things. It's terrible to say, but it's factual. Where somebody has their neck injured, let's say, and blood sprays across the room. That is absolutely realistic. That's the amount of pressure that we're dealing with coming up out of the heart. And that's just two little branches off the aorta. The aorta has mass pressure. Mass pressure. It's very impressive. All right. Uh, mechanisms of venous return. So once uh, blood is pumped all around the body, how does it get back to the heart? Well, this happens through five mechanisms. One's a pressure gradient. So uh, the blood pumping out of the heart pushes blood back to the heart. That's factual, but it's actually not enough. Okay, to get blood back up from the legs, you can't just pump blood into the legs. That's not enough pressure to push all that blood back to the heart. So there are other ways. Gravity. Gravity is a good way to get blood back to the heart. Um, well, let's see. If you will, or you could, I guess, put a hand up in the air and leave it there for a period of time, uh, what you would notice is that after a few moments, when you bring that hand back down and look at it compared to the other, one hand will look different. Okay, typically one hand will look different. And that's because gravity drains blood from the upper half of the body very effectively. Like you can hold that arm up for a little bit of time and you can really feel the blood drain out of it. You can feel the tips of your fingers changing. Right? That's because blood drains out via gravity. From the upper half of the body, gravity works great. Uh, skeletal muscle pump. So every time you flex your muscles and do the things that you do, you augment the way that blood flows around your body. So every time you flex your muscles, that helps to squirt a little bit of blood back towards the heart via the, uh, the venous system. Uh, thoracic or respiratory pump. So your heart is found in the same cavity as your lungs, in the thoracic cavity. So when you breathe in, what you're really doing is you're causing a negative pressure in the thoracic cavity to pull air in via your lungs. But inadvertently, what that does is it also sucks blood from the body back into the thoracic cavity, back into the heart. And uh, then last but not least, cardiac suction. So when your atria, for example, when your uh, ventricles, when they contract and they're strongly contracted, they push all the blood in them out. But then when they relax, that act of relaxation actually sucks a little bit of blood back into the heart, all right? And uh, all of these combined serve to allow blood to pass back to the heart to be reprocessed and then sent back around to the body. So yeah, that's how that goes. Uh, all right, let's talk about heartbeat and heart rate and how this is regulated. Boy, there's a lot to talk about here. Uh, internally, the heart will control itself, all right? Your heart has a few parts that we need to talk about and then we'll talk about how they really work. So we've got this SA node, an AV node, this little piece kind of comes down to what are called the branches, the bundle branches 
uh, the branches of the Atrio Ventricular Bundle. I'll call them the bundle branches, is what they really are. And then this comes out to one of my favorite word sets in science. These are considered the Purkinje fibers. Okay, I love the whole, like you can say that to your friends and say, you know, I learned about the Purkinje fibers today. And you're going to sound like you're doing something impressive. SA means sinoatrial, sinoatrial node. AV means atrioventricular node, AV node. Then you come down the bundle branches to the Purkinje fibers. Now, this is what happens. The SA node is a special place in the heart. Uh, what will happen here is very simplistic. Uh, the cells of the SA node are what we'd call leaky. They constantly leak out small amounts of ions and small amounts of ions and small amounts of ions. And eventually, so many ions leak through the cells of the SA node that they depolarize. Instantaneous, bam, depolarization. And when they depolarize, they fire off a signal that travels through the muscle of the heart, hits the AV node, which then blasts the signal down to the bundle branches, down to the Purkinje fibers, and innervates the ventricles simultaneously, leading to a mass, boom, contraction, and then relaxation. This SA node causes the contraction of the atria, basically. All right, the SA node and the AV node, what they're doing here is they're leading to the contraction of the atria, followed by a contraction of the ventricles. Uh, it looks like this, okay? It's a good example. You can see the SA node, followed by the AV node, down the bundle branches, and up to Purkinje fibers, okay? That's how heart rate works, is using this system. Uh, now, there's a few things to say here. Do I want to say them? I don't know how deep I want to take you. I'm here to tell you, this is a rabbit hole, folks. Uh, it's very impressive how this works. I'm, I'm just going to say the following. So, uh, this happens... This happens automatically. This is what they call a pacemaking system. Now, you've heard of an electronic implanted pacemaker, all right? That's just using the term of what this is. This is a pacemaker. An implanted pacemaker just helps this work better, all right? Uh, so the heart can, like if you um, look at, go and watch a YouTube video on a heart transplant or something, or, um, well, there are darker things, I suppose. You can see, <laughs> there are people in other parts of the world that consume, uh, like, frog hearts and things, and they stay beating for, you know, 20 minutes after they've been removed. The idea is the heart will keep beating regardless of anything else. The heart will continue to beat even if it's not even in the body. Uh, because this system continues working outside of any nervous control. The body, external control, your brain has the capacity to regulate heart rate a little bit, but the heart can beat without any regulation externally. Yeah. All right. Um, so blood pressure. So your blood pressure should be something like 120 over 70. That's a nice blood pressure. If you're a smaller person, it can be lower. If you're a bigger person, it can naturally be a little higher. Now, there can be numbers which are a little too much. We'll talk about those in just a second. Uh, but generally about 120 over 70. Your heart rate at rest should be about 70, 70 times per minute. Uh, and each minute, your whole blood volume is cycled with that 70 beats. Now, uh, you have two numbers here. These are called systole and diastole. The first number, 120, is a systolic number, and 70, the second number, is a diastolic number. Systole, the systolic number, uh, is where the heart really is beating. Boom. The pressure during ventricular contraction is like 120 uh, millimeters of mercury is how we measure pressure. So during contraction, boom, that's the systolic pressure. That's the high number. Diastolic pressure is as low as the pressure gets in your arterial networks before the next pressure wave arrives. So imagine, boom, 120. Relax for a few moments. The pressure is dropping, 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 dropping. 70, boom, another systolic wave. So systole is the pressure during contraction. The diastolic number is the lowest the pressure gets during relaxation of the ventricles. Yeah. Uh, I mean, this is what it looks like, and I don't think I'm going to go into the detail here. You know, if we were face-to-face, -face, we would have this conversation, but we're not, so we won't. Uh, what I will point out is this is what an ECG looks like, an electrocardiograph, and what will happen is you'll see like in a movie or something like that, it'll go beep, 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 yes, it's like spike, 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 spike. Uh, what that is, the spikes here are uh, bam, ventricular contraction, bam, ventricular contraction, bam, ventricular contraction. That's really what's happening there. 
Um, I will point out fibrillation just for interest's sake. So uh, you may have heard of a defibrillator. Back in the Dark Ages, they look like this. Nowadays, they're like little tabs that you can put on somebody's chest and are very, very much more simplified. Um, what can happen is if the heart, if the body's freaking out, it's releasing all kinds of crazy hormones, man, the heart can start to beat super, super fast. Beep, 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 beep. It's trying to beat so fast, so fast that it just can't go as fast as it's trying to beat. So instead of beating and pumping blood, it just starts to quiver. Okay? That's fibrillation. It's not actually beating. It's just kind of freaking out and it's just kind of quivering and as this happens it's not pumping blood so you can die from this so what do we do we defibrillate your rear end by using a defibrillator and what this does is it zaps the heart imagine the heart is all built off of electrical conveyance mechanisms all of this madness this is all electronic conveyance internally using ions so what we do is we zap the heart and it sends an electrical charge through the heart and the heart goes locks up and then when the electrical charge goes away the heart rests and it goes whoo be like bump bump and back to normal uh a normal ecg so the idea is by zapping the heart it locks it all up and then it can go back to a resting state in unison and then begin to beat as usual so that's how you defibrillate a heart that's what a defibrillator is uh bearer receptors and the order pressure so I will point out a very simple concept to you. Your body has baroreceptors. Like for instance in your carotid artery, you have baroreceptors. What these baroreceptors do is they sense stretch in an arterial or an artery. They sense the amount of stretch. So when your heart beats, it stretches your arteries a little bit. And you have baroreceptors that pick up just how much stretch has occurred. Uh, this is how your body determines how much pressure your heart is generating. And if the baroreceptors tell the brain that the pressure's too high, your body's got to take steps to bring it back down. If the pressure's too low, the baroreceptors pick up that the pressure's too low and will take steps to bring that pressure back up. So it's very simple how this is done. It's a very simple process. So how does it work? Let me describe. If the pressure's too high, what will happen is your brain will realize this and it'll cause your heart rate to slow down. If the heart's going bump, 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 and your blood pressure's too high, your brain causes the heart to slow down. Bump, 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 bump. And it brings your pressure down. Alternatively, if your pressure's too high and your blood vessels look like this, what your heart will do is cause vasodilation. Boom. The vessels get bigger. That means more blood can flow through more easily, so the pressure drops. It's just how this works. It's very simple. Uh, and it's the opposite of that when you talk about if the pressure's too low. If the pressure's too low, baroreceptors pick this up so they constrict your blood vessels, which makes the pressure go up, and you increase the heart rate, which makes the pressure go up. Very simple. Too low, take steps to bring it back up. Too high, take steps to bring it back down. That's how it goes. Um, let's see here. So... I think we really just need to talk about lymph nodes and lymphatic system here. Uh, let me explain what happens. So this is a capillary bed, artery, arterial, capillaries. Capillaries are very leaky. What will happen is, as blood flows through the capillaries, uh, as blood flows through the capillaries, fluid leaks out, and that's how you get exchanged to the cells. So the cells can get all the, the nutrients and oxygen they need from fluid leaking out of the capillaries. Uh, and then most of that fluid, the plasma basically, comes back into the capillaries to go into the venule, into the vein, and then back to where it needs to be. But some fluid gets left behind. Okay, Every time your heart beats in a capillary bed, a little bit of fluid is left behind. And there's got to be a way to get that fluid back to the cardiovascular system, or you could have swelling and edema. Okay, So the way that we do this is we have lymphatic system. Uh, let me rephrase. We have a lymphatic system. Uh, you, you have lymphatic vessels that are all around your capillary beds, and every time fluid leaks out of your capillaries, some of it that gets left behind comes into the lymphatic system. Okay, the lymphatic system returns fluid to the cardiovascular system. That is what it does. The lymphatic system picks up excess tissue fluid. When you have swelling or anything like that, uh, the lymphatic system picks up the excess fluid and carries it back to the heart. And while it's doing that, it checks it to see if there's anything there that shouldn't be there. So your lymphatic system is also involved with immunity. So if you've got a bacterial infection or something like that, you know your lymph nodes swell up. 
That's because your uh, lymphatic system tests any tissue fluid that it's carrying for any kind of foreign pathogens that could cause you problems. So let me say that one more time. Every time your heart beats, your capillaries leak out fluid that exchanges nutrients and oxygen and all that fun stuff with surrounding tissues. Some of the fluid that's leaked out doesn't get back into the cardiovascular system. So it's picked up by the lymphatic system and then carried back to the heart. Yeah. Cardiovascular disease. So why should we care about cardiovascular disease? Well, it causes about $500 billion per year of uh, monetary damage to uh, people in the Western world. So it's, this is a very, very big deal. And this involves several disorders, hypertension or high blood pressure, atherosclerosis, strokes, heart attacks, and aneurysms. Now there's a pile of preventable risk factors here. So if you don't smoke, you don't drink, or um, you don't drink heavily, there's a lot of data that suggests that a little bit of red wine, for instance, a day keeps the doctor away, uh, both in relaxing you and providing other effects. Um, but that's a story for another day. If you want to look up what's called the French paradox when it comes to uh, red wine and heart disease, like there's a lot of good reading out there. Um, being very sedentary and having a, a poor diet, especially with increased sugar, this really drives heart rate or heart problems, I should say, and obviously stress. All right, stress is a real killer. So uh, I know it's hard to avoid, but you know, I'm just telling you. And weirdly enough, a good way to avoid having cardiovascular issues, cardiovascular issues, is by making sure that you have good dental hygiene. We don't know exactly what drives this, but people with um, major dental issues, like major dental pain constantly and what have you, they tend to have much increased heart issues. Uh, we don't know exactly how that parallel works, but it, it, it's real. It's something about the inflammatory chemicals released as a response to dental issues causes the heart just to freak out. So uh, avoiding dental problems is, is ideal for preventing heart disease as well. All right. First and foremost, atherosclerosis leads to most of the rest of this. Uh, what we're talking about here is the buildup of what are called plaques of fat, of cholesterol, typically of a, a sterol, really is what this is, a sterol, in the ar arterial wall. So you can see this here. What this does is it blocks off a little bit of the arterial wall, and by blocking off a little bit of the arterial wall, it plays all kinds of hell with the pressure flowing through there. Um, so uh, uh, these are called plaques. Plaques that are stationary are called a thrombus, and then when they move around, they're called in, an embolus or an embolism. Um, they're highly associated with strokes and heart attacks and aneurysms. Imagine this thing breaking loose, floating around the body, going to the brain, and blocking off part of the brain. That's a stroke. Okay. Um, the best way to prevent this from being a problem is by having a lot of omega-3 fatty acids in your diet. So eat fish once or twice a week. Take omega-3 pills, decrease your sugar intake to decrease inflammation in your vessels, and you can really, really augment your chances of having heart disease. All right, uh, so let's talk hypertension. Hypertension is any blood pressure higher than 140 over 90. If it's more than 140 over 90, that's hypertension, and oftentimes this is due to arterial plaques. So the plaques build up, and that causes all kinds of crazy pressure, and that high pressure is an issue. Now, normally you don't notice this until it's too late. What really happens is high blood pressure wears out the elasticity of your arterial networks. This leads to heart attacks and strokes and kidney failure and all kinds of other problems. Um, so very, very dangerous. This is hypertension, high blood pressure, wearing out your arterial networks. Strokes, I feel like we've already done, but I'll, I'll just run you through this again. The idea is that something happens to block off, like maybe a, a plaque breaks loose and it flows into the brain and it blocks off an area of the brain. That area of the brain now no longer gets oxygen. And because it's not getting oxygen, that area of the brain quits working. It's a classic stroke. Uh, what we try to do here again is, is treat the person with uh, anticoagulants in most cases, and we can decrease the, the effect of that stroke. Okay, We can really make it not as bad as it could be otherwise. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Face, arms, speech, and time. Uh, look at somebody's face, you can tell it's very visible if they're having a stroke. Arms, tell them to lift their arms up if one doesn't work as well as the other. That's a classic example of a stroke. If speech, if they can't understand what you're saying, or um, when they speak back to you, then it's nonsense. That's classic stroke condition. And in most, or I'm going to say in some cases, if you can just get the person to the hospital quickly, time is of the essence, 
Uh, you can decrease the effects of a stroke. All right, heart attacks. Uh, heart, at heart attacks are called myocardial infarctions. Uh, what will happen here is there will be a blockage somewhere in the arteries of the heart. And uh, when that blockage happens, the area downstream doesn't get oxygen and the, the muscle stops working. It's strokes and heart attacks, same concept. A blockage of an artery leads to an area of the body not working. A stroke is the brain, a heart attack is the heart. Uh, and then there are aneurysms. Aneurysms are where a vessel loses its elasticity. Again, side effect of high blood pressure. And when that vessel loses elasticity, it can balloon out and even rupture. This is incredibly dangerous. Um, so you may have heard of someone just dropping dead. Okay, this is, oh yeah, well, it's a young guy, and who knows what happened. He just was walking around, just collapsed. That, that's a very typical of a ruptured aneurysm in and around the brain. Uh, let's see here. We need to talk about angioplasty and stents. All right, so bypass surgery, stents, and angioplasty. Stents and angioplasty work together. Bypass surgery is a different animal. You may have heard somebody having like a double bypass, triple bypass, quadruple bypass. What they're doing is when there's a blockage in one of these major arteries coming off the heart to feed the heart muscle, we can actually pipe in a new vessel up to the aorta and pipe blood down past the blockage. And that's a bypass. We're bypassing the blockage. It's a good way to get blood into the heart. A typical, very typical surgery these days. Stents and angioplasty tend to come first. Uh, if somebody has a blockage in the heart, what we can do is we can send in a tool through the leg. We go up through the leg, up, 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 all the way up the vena cava, what have you, up the aorta, I should say, into the heart's um, uh, internal vessels. We can carry this tiny little tube in there, and uh, it's got a little bitty balloon on the end. And what will happen is we'll find the blockage using ultrasound, expand the balloon, and then when the balloon relaxes, it leaves a little piece of wire in there that holds the vessel open. That wire is a stent. The ballooning process is called angioplasty. Okay, uh, so what we tend to do is first we go and we do stents and angioplasty. And then if that's not doing as well as it has to do to keep the person working, we'll go in and do bypass surgery. It works. Um, just for kind of fun, you can actually... Uh, go and watch this video. It's pretty cool. Um, we make hearts for people. Sometimes it's just a ventricular assistance device. Sometimes it's a completely motorized heart like Dick Cheney. <laughs> uh, he doesn't have a heart per se anymore. Uh, you can't get a blood pressure off the guy. Or I'm sorry, a heart. You can't hear his heart if you were to put his, your head on his chest. Because he has a motorized internal heart. Um, it's terrifying, frankly. But... Anyway, um, yeah, okay, so now then, we're going to move on to the blood. That's going to be uh, the second half of this video, so let's stop here, and then we'll pick up on the blood in just a second. And, new video. Back with the second half of the lecture. This is on blood. Okay, so uh, what are the functions of blood? Generally speaking, transportation and defense are the two main ones that we need to be concerned with. Transportation of everything conveyed by your blood all right so oxygen nutrients the waste products that result from your metabolism carbon dioxide that results from cellular respiration and any hormones that are released by your endocrine system okay so all of this is moved around via the bloodstream uh, to keep you living and doing what you do on a daily basis and also your blood contains white blood cells white blood cells and platelets all right that are involved in defense of your system White blood cells, white blood cells, I should say, uh, which are concerned with fighting off, you know, bacterial infections or, or what have you, destroying virally infected cells, and then obviously platelets, uh, which help to seal off busted um, vessels. And any openings in your uh, cardiovascular system can be sealed off using platelets. And uh, your blood's also going to have a variety of regulatory functions. The the main one that comes to mind here is uh, regulating your body temperature okay so uh, the blood is certainly going to be involved in regulating body temperature by sending blood to the skin you radiate heat and lose body temperature by conserving blood in the core of the body you keep from losing heat you conserve 
uh, body temperature. So these are, are uh, functions of the blood. Water and salt balance are also involved here. So uh, the amount of salt that leaves via the urine also regulates the amount of water that leaves via the urine. And further, the uh, kidneys are involved in regulating bodily pH. Okay, so the blood is involved in all of these things. Now, when you um, have blood drawn, what they will do to this in most cases is they'll analyze the uh, the, the hematocrit, okay, the, the amount of uh, different parts of your blood. What will happen is you take the blood, you spin it down in a centrifuge, spin, 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 and the heavier stuff sinks and the lighter stuff floats. And what you end up with is about 55% of the blood being plasma. That's a, kind of a straw-colored goldish fluid is plasma, more than half. Very small amount that we call the buffy coat. Okay, the buffy coat is going to be the white blood cells mainly, platelets as well, but mainly white blood cells. And then the bottom is the heavy red blood cells, the erythrocytes, about 45%, generally speaking, on average. Males tend to have a little more, females tend to have a little less. Uh, but the uh, the red blood cells are very heavy. They're uh, they have iron atoms in them, so they are quite heavy. So they sink. And if you look at this on a actual centrifuge tube, it looks like this: mostly clear, tiny little white circle, then all red at the base. All right, physical characteristics of blood: a metallic taste. You can pick up like a coppery flavor, if you will. It's a lot of iron in the blood. You're picking up metallic, is what it is. Always red. I have students every year, and they're like, "But when I look at my blood vessels, they look purple or green." Or no, that's all random refraction of light. Your blood is always red, no matter what. It'll be like a bright, uh, brilliant red when it's full of oxygen, and when it's low oxygen, like venous blood, it, it takes on a very dark crimson appearance. A uh, very thick, gooey texture, all right, thick and gooey texture, uh, pH around 7.4, and uh, the volume is about, really dependent upon, upon body size, but around 5 to 6 liters, generally speaking, around 5 liters. All right, yes, perfect, perfect, let's go here. So blood is a fluid-connected tissue, okay, it lacks collagen elastic fibers, but it does have other dissolved fibers which participate in clotting activities. Most of the blood is plasma, or what's seen as clear fluid here in this image. This is a photomicrograph of a uh, blood smear. This is what blood actually looks like under magnification. Uh, so most of this is open space, is what I'm saying here. And that is plasma. The plasma is the open space. Um, basically just water. Plasma is mostly water. So the idea is that most of your blood most of it is water. Okay, most of your blood's water. That's why it's quite fluid. So that's all this open space is plasma, and plasma is mostly water. Um, then there are what are called the formed elements. And the formed elements are any red blood cells, white blood cells, or platelets. Red blood cells are little pink donuts. White blood cells are seen here as purple. All right, purple. And the platelets are the little flaky pieces. There's little platelets, platelet, 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 platelet. Platelet, platelet, little platelets. There's little bitty pieces, and they're going to be involved in blood clotting. So red blood cells or erythrocytes are right uh, are here. Okay, they carry oxygen. White blood cells or leukocytes, which fight off infections, and then platelets. Um, I will just say platelets, which are these little flakes that are going to deal with blood clotting. Yeah. Uh, so where do they come from? Well, all blood cells come from your bone marrow. So in your bone marrow, you have stem cells. Uh, these what are called erythropoietic stem cells, and uh, or hematopoietic stem cells, I should say. And uh, there's two forms of bone marrow. There's red and yellow. We're concerned with red marrow here, as it makes all blood cells. Makes all blood cells. So a single stem cell can lead to the production of erythrocytes or any of the leukocytes or platelets. Uh, it doesn't matter. So a stem cell in your bone marrow can make anything that is necessary. I think something interesting to point out is that. Red blood cells tend to have a very short level. Let me try again. Red blood cells tend to have a very short shelf life because they don't have a nucleus. They can't fix damage if they have damage, so they don't live very long. White blood cells can live years and years and years. Okay, they can be very old indeed. Uh, and then platelets have like a, 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 I think I have it on here somewhere, but I think it's like a 14-day life cycle. They're very short because what platelets do, and this is kind of crazy, and I expect you to know this. To make platelets, you make this huge, what's called a megakaryocyte cell, or megakaryoblast, megakaryocyte, and it ruptures. 
It explodes, basically. And all the little pieces of it become platelets. So they're not even cells. They're just little pieces of cells. And they degrade very quickly as a result of that. Perfect. Red blood cells and oxygen. So red blood cells carry oxygen. Red blood cells contain uh, ox I'm sorry, iron atoms that bind up oxygen. And you can throw numbers at this, and it's kind of fun to do this. But the idea is there's no nucleus here, so they get this biconcave shape. And that increases their surface area so that they're more uh, capable of exporting and moving gases. The idea is that each red blood cell contains about 280 million hemoglobin molecules. And again, I would never ask you this. This is kind of for fun. Uh, each of which can bind three molecules of oxygen. 280 billion hemoglobins per red blood cell, each of which binds three molecules of oxygen. And in a drop of blood, you got 20 or 30 trillion red blood cells. In other words, man, we can store a lot of a lot of oxygen in our tissues. Now, carbon dioxide is a little different. Red blood cells carry oxygen. Carbon dioxide tends to travel as bicarb in the plasma. There can be a little bit in and on the red blood cells, but most of it is carried in the plasma. Now, worthy of mention here is carbon monoxide. Uh, you probably know that carbon monoxide poisoning is a real issue. The thing about carbon monoxide, which forms from the uh, incomplete breakdown of fossil fuels, is that it has a high affinity for iron, for hemoglobin. Uh, when you have oxygen in the atmosphere and carbon monoxide in the atmosphere, the carbon monoxide will outcompete for your red blood cells and keep the oxygen away from your red blood cells. Uh, so the carbon monoxide, well, the way people die from this is by having it in too high of a concentration in their environment and it prevents their red blood cells from binding oxygen, so they die from a lack of oxygen. Terrible. Production of red blood cells called erythropoiesis. Now, let's see, what else do I want to say here? Let me just lay this on you. So your kidneys actually determine the amount of uh, red blood cells in your body. Let me say that again. Your kidneys determine how many red blood cells your body carries. They do this through the submission of a um, hormone called erythropoietin. All right, erythropoietin. So this is what happens. If your kidneys sense that your blood's oxygen level is good, then all's well in the world, then they just sit there and be kidneys. But if your kidneys sense a low oxygen environment, try again, if your kidneys sense a low oxygen environment, they release erythropoietin. And what erythropoietin does is it stimulates your bone marrow to make more red blood cells. And then once you've made more red blood cells, the amount of oxygen in the blood stabilizes and the kidneys are happy. So they stop secreting erythropoietin. You probably have heard of this guy down here. That's Lance Armstrong. What he was caught doing, actually, was taking an artificial erythropoietin to raise his red blood cell count to make him a more competent athlete. So if you can carry more oxygen in your tissues, uh, you're more athletically capable and uh, that's, that's what he was doing to, to cheat at cycling. All right, so the idea is the kidneys can sense oxygen levels. If the oxygen level's too low, they release erythropoietin that stimulates bone marrow and makes more red blood cells. All right, disorders of red blood cells. Anemia, sickle cell, jaundice, and uh, what's called hemolytic disease. So anemia is a side effect of some other problem. Let me say it again. Anemia, general anemia, is a side effect of some other problem. This is any kind of condition where there's low iron in the blood. This can be a symptom of kidney failure in most cases, or uh, bone marrow issues. I mean, you name it. It can be caused by all sorts, all sorts of things, I should say. Uh, and again, it's a symptom. Anytime there's low iron in the blood, this results in red blood cells not working as well as they should. That's anemia. All right, sickle cell is fascinating. Sickle cell is only found in the small populations on this planet, typically in sub-Saharan Africa. And what you end up with is red blood cells that form improperly. And when they improperly form, they take on this sickle shape, okay, a sickle shape. And they just kind of stack up and pile up in your arterial networks. And uh, that prevents blood from flowing through that area. And if blood can't, blood can't flow through, uh, those tissues go anoxic and it's very, very painful. It's not a fun situation. Now, let me explain sickle cell a little bit. Uh, sickle cell, basically, you have to get a sickle cell trait from your mom and a sickle cell trait from your dad to have sickle cell anemia and be ill and have this condition. 
Oftentimes, however, people just have a single sickle cell trait. And what's interesting about having a single sickle cell trait, just one from mom, but nothing from dad, or just one from dad and nothing from mom, is that people who carry a sickle cell trait are immune to malaria. Okay, So we believe that sickle cell is actually an adaptation to uh, assist populations in areas that are stricken with malaria in the uh, deep past. So think about the last 100,000 years. People that lived in these areas uh, were subject to malaria at extremely high rates, but if they had a single sickle cell trait, they were basically immune to this mosquito-borne disease. Uh, and that was better than otherwise. So uh, if you didn't have a sickle cell trait, that would lead you to die from malaria at an incre incredibly high rate. The numbers are just astounding. Hundreds of thousands of people. Uh, and uh, so that made this beneficial and thus an adaptation, which is fascinating. And then there's jaundice. Jaundice is a condition where the liver isn't excre excreting heme effectively, is what I say here. Basically, the breakdown products of red blood cells include two compounds, bilirubin and biliverdin. We're going to talk about bilirubin here. What will happen is if the liver can't break this down effectively, uh, you, this results in certain pigments flowing through the bloodstream and accruing in the tissues. And with jaundice, what you end up with is the skin taking on a yellowish hue, or the eyes, or the gums, and what have you. It takes on a yellowish coloration, and that's classic jaundice. This is very prevalent in newborns. Basically, the liver isn't fully functional just yet, so the kid's got jaundice. Very common. What we do for this is we put them under UV radiation, and the UV light, as you can see here, uh, hits these uh, compounds in the skin or what have you, and the UV will actually bust them up and give the liver a little bit of time to get started. This is very common. Very normal. Very common. And then there's hemolytic disease of the newborn. And this is a major problem. And I'm going to talk about this more in detail in just a minute. But the idea is that with hemolytic disease, mom's immune system basically leads to the baby's blood cells being destroyed. And this is very dangerous. So we're going to talk about how this happens in just a second. All right, white blood cells in the form of elements. These are leukocytes. Uh, what do I want to say about white blood cells? One, they're very rare. Uh, very rare. You see very few. This is actually a disease called... It called eosinophilia. Um, this also is basically what it would look like if somebody has um, leukemia. But anyway, uh, so very rare, very few of them, about 1% of the blood is going to be white blood cells. Mm, what do we want to say? Okay, they arise from bone marrow. They don't actually stay in your bloodstream very long, your white blood cells. They don't stay in the blood. What they tend to do is they flow through the blood and then they use cellular adhesion molecules. And what's called diapetesis, there's some amoeboid motion, diapetesis, uh, to move out of the blood and hang out in your tissue spaces. So like the area between cells or the area outside of blood vessels, they just kind of sit around and look for pathogens. A lot of them just go to your lymph nodes and just live in your lymph nodes their whole life, like 20 years in a lymph node, just hanging out, waiting for anything to come through. Um, yeah, white blood cells, combat diseases, bacteria, viruses, parasites, toxins, what have you what have you, typically outside the tissues. And they are, there are a variety of shapes and sizes here, and I'm just, I'm not going to go into all the details here. Basically, there are a bunch of different white blood cells that do a lot of different things, and their numbers can change rapidly in a short period of time. So if you're exposed to a certain disease or something like that, and you've had a, a vaccination for that, or you've had it in the past, you can just rapidly, rapidly change the number of white blood cells in your tissues to deal with um, that disease. Yeah, that'll work. All right, disorders of white blood cells. So SIDS, or severe combined immunodeficiency disease, leukemia, and mononucleosis. So uh, with SID or severe combined immunodeficiency disease, this is oftentimes coined the bubble boy situation. You may have seen the movie, or you can, since you're on YouTube, I assume right now, you can just type in bubble boy trailer and watch the trailer. The idea is that there's a mutation, a genetic alteration that causes certain enzymes to not function correctly. So the immune system can't, the white blood cells can't fight off disease effectively. So if the immune system can't fight off disease effectively, that means that this person can die from anything. A minor cold, for example, can be completely fatal. Very, very dangerous. Uh, then there's leukemia. All right, leukemia is a group of cancers. There can be several different types of white blood cells basically making 
Uh, white blood cells proliferate and grow into massive numbers, diluting the blood down, and these white blood cells don't work anymore, so they don't function. So a uh, person with leukemia doesn't die from leukemia, they die from a cold, because they can't fight off diseases in the same family. Um, yeah. And then there's, of course, mononucleosis. This is Epstein-Barr virus. I used to call this the kissing disease. Uh, what will happen here is you get a, a whole bunch of white blood cells, and they pile up in, uh, like, your, your lymph nodes, or they pile up in your, um, what do you call them, tonsils, or they pile up in the spleen, and they make those areas swell up, and it's just a terrible feeling. You feel awful and gross, and it can last for weeks and weeks and weeks. It's no fun at all. It never goes away. It can recur easily past from one person to the next. This very low fun factor. All right. Uh, how do platelets clot blood? How much detail do we want to go into here? All right, I'm just going to lay some facts on you, and we're going to call it on this particular concept. So when you puncture a blood vessel, okay, you get a cut. You stab a blood vessel. There are actually chemicals in the wall of the vessel that call for help, and they call for platelets to stack up. So platelets start stacking up, and then as your blood flows... There are uh, platelets as they stack up. They release chemicals that cause uh, fibers, called fibrin, that is inside of the blood that's all dissolved. It comes out of suspension and becomes a fiber. And it lays down a fibrous matrix across the area of damage. And it looks like this. this is a real uh, transmission, I think, a transmission image of a uh, fibrin clot. So what you see is a bunch of platelets in there and a bunch of fibers sort of holding everything together makes a net that keeps red blood cells from escaping. So if you cut yourself, it'll drip, 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 stop. And the reason it stops is because this clot has formed, this net-like structure has formed to keep you from further losing blood. And then there's hemophilia. So hemophilia is a genetically transmitted um, disease, if you will, that leads to the blood not clotting correctly. So a person whom is a hemophiliac, they get a cut and it doesn't clot. Okay, if they get a cut and it doesn't clot, this is a real problem. Um, and it's actually genetic. So this is called a sex-linked trait. Okay, sex-linked trait. It travels exclusively on the female uh, chromosome, the X chromosome, um, and it's kind of fascinating how this all works. Now let me explain first how male and female works. Uh, if you have two X chromosomes, that makes you genetically female. If you have an X chromosome and a Y chromosome, that makes you genetically male. Okay. Now um, the genes for blood clotting travel exclusively on the X chromosome, exclusively on the X chromosome. So what will happen is this. Ladies, congratulations. Uh, your risk of hemophilia is very limited. Very limited. Because you have two X chromosomes. Because you have two X chromosomes, you get two chances at getting the required genetics for blood clotting. But gentlemen, you only have one X chromosome. And what that means is you get one chance, one shot, at getting the genetics for blood clotting. And if you get the wrong genetics for blood clotting, that's hemophilia. Uh, and there's a bunch of different types, but this is considered a sex-linked trait because it travels, uh, and it is primarily effect, affects one sex or the other. It travels on the sex chromosomes, X and Y. Now, there's a famous example of this, and it involves the images that you see here. This is the last Tsar of Russia. This is Tsar Nicholas II and his son, Alexei. Okay, I uh, forget which one's his wife. I believe that's Ale Alexandra in the back. Uh, what happened is Alexei was born, and if you're not aware, the royal families of Europe are horribly inbred, big time, inbreeding. And the side effect of this is uh, what geneticists call inbreeding depression. That's the accrual of deleterious or bad genetic traits uh, as a result of uh, breeding together close family members. And the side effect of this was that hemophilia traveled in this inbred royal family line. And Alexei had hemophilia, which is a problem at the time because he was the only male heir to be the next Tsar of Russia. 
Now, <clears throat> Kit's gonna die. He's got hemophilia. You know, there's no cure for this at the time. Uh, so what would he do? So the mom, Alexandra, found a faith healer that said that he could take care of Alexei's problem. And this faith healer became very famous. His name was Rasputin. That's the actual guy. You ever seen the uh, Disney show about... Yeah, they're, it's real. This is all real stuff. And he actually did fix the kid. So every time the kid started having a bleed or some sort of major problem, uh, Rasputin could come in and basically take care of it. Yeah. Hey, girl. Hey, I'm in the middle of something, okay? Do you see? I see it. I think you did a great job. I drew it all by myself. You did draw it all by yourself. I drew it out Okay, you did a great job. I love it. You're such a big girl. Okay, let me work. Bye. Bye. <laughs> back, back to business. So, uh, yeah, well, nobody knows exactly how it all worked out, but uh, it's a real thing, man. It, it actually happened. And if you want to read some crazy stories, go and look up these folks. He, uh, it, he didn't, he, he died badly. All right, moving on. Uh, donating blood's completely safe. Uh, probably going to be a thing of the past pretty soon. We're going to start making clonal blood in a relatively short period of time. Uh, but you will you lose about a pint of blood. Your blood volume really doesn't change. Uh, your, your kidneys will sense a loss of fluid and immediately refresh uh, the fluid content of the blood in very short order. And so your blood volume won't change, but your red blood cell count will go down and your kidneys will pick up that you have a low oxygen environment in your tissues. And they'll start cranking out erythropoietin, which will lead to the production of more red blood cells. Uh, in a very short period of time, you'll be completely back to normal. So donating blood is completely safe and okay. Uh, but you probably have heard a little something about blood typing. And I think it's worthy for us to discuss blood typing. Okay, so let's do that now. Um, there are a few terms you need to know. And these are antigen and antibody. Antigen and antibody. Uh, antigens are foreign substances, let's say. Uh, Sugar is typically on the external surface of cells. Yeah, that's really enough. And then there are antibodies. Antibodies are protein markers for antigens. Let me explain. So, um, what will happen is this. All of your cells have external markers that say, these are mine. Okay, those are called antigens. Okay, antigens on your cells that basically dictate that those are your cells and not somebody else's cells. Somebody else's cells will have different antigens than yours. And if your body were to pick up different antigens, you would make, as a function of your immune system, antibodies. And those antibodies uh, basically mark foreign antigens for death. It's like putting a big target on a foreign cell and say, this one's a bad one, destroy it please. Your immune system comes in and mops the floor with them. So any cells that are marked by antibodies will be destroyed by your white blood cells. All your cells have antigens that help you to do what's called self-non-self recognition. Now, what the heck does all this have to do with? Well, it has to do with blood typing. Okay, there are three basic groupings for blood types. There's A antigens, there are B antigens, and there's rhesus factor antigens. And uh, this basically is why we can't just pipe in whatever blood we want to pipe into anybody. It looks something like this. This is a chart you need to be able to fill out on your test. Let me say it again. This is a chart that you need to be able to fill out on your test. All right. Sometimes red blood cells have type A antigens. That will be type A blood. person with type A blood has type A antigens. What that means is that if they were ever exposed to other blood types, they have the capacity to make antibodies against type B blood cells. I have type A antigens. That means that I will fight off and destroy any blood that comes in with type B antigens. I can make antibodies against type B blood. I'm type A. A person who is type B blood has type B antigens on their blood cells. Cellular markers. What's your blood type? Type B. That means that you have type B antigens. What if you're exposed to type A blood? Your body's going to say, oh, type A blood's foreign. Let's make antibodies against it to destroy those. Mark them for death. If you're type B, you can make antibodies against type A blood. 
But what if you're type AB? What if your blood type is AB? If you're type AB blood, yeah, yeah, sorry, I was missing it for a second. What that means is you have type B antigens and type A antigens. You have both. You have both antigens. You have type A and type B. And because of that, you can't make any antibodies against type A or type B blood. This person is considered a universal recipient. You can pipe in any kind of blood you want to them, and they can't make any antibodies against it. They're totally fine. And then last but not least, there's type O blood. Type O blood is completely devoid of any antigens of any form. There are no cellular markers on these red blood cells. Side effect of that? You can take this blood and put it into anyone, and they are completely fine. There are no markers on these cells, ergo, there's no antibodies that can attack them. This person is considered a universal donor. They can donate blood to anybody, and it's totally fine. The problem is a person with type O blood can only receive type O blood. Because any A's or B's, they can make antibodies against this. Okay? Now, I would invite you to rewind and watch that like two or three times so that you understand that antigens are markers on the outside of cells. Antibodies can be made in response to these markers to destroy foreign cells. If I'm type A, that means I have type A antigens. If I'm ever exposed to type B antigens, I will make antibodies against it so I can destroy them. Yeah, perfect. Now, then there's positive and negative. This is rhesus factor. This is just another side effect of uh, blood typing. So you may be like type B positive. That would be you have that would mean that you have type B antigens, and you're also positive for rhesus factor. Uh, I'm not terribly concerned. This is uh, named after rhesus monkeys. This is where we discovered this. But where this becomes a problem is during pregnancy. What this can lead to is what's called hemolytic disease of the newborn. And I shortened this a little bit. Uh, just to make it a little more concise. All right, let me explain. Uh, first comment is that antibodies, antibodies can cross the placenta and get into a baby's bloodstream. When mom has antibodies, they cross the placenta and they get into the bloodstream. This is a good thing. This is very good. Uh, what this means is that when a baby is born, that baby basically has mom's immune system for a few weeks. Okay, wonderful idea, perfect, wonderful idea. Uh, this capacity of the kid to be born with a functioning immune system for a period of time. But there's one potential downside, and that is if dad is rhesus positive and mom is rhesus negative. If dad's rhesus positive and mom is rhesus negative, it's possible that that baby could get rhesus positive uh, blood, uh, let me rephrase that, it's possible that that baby's genetics could be for rhesus-positive blood type. There we go. That'll do. Dad might give that kid the genetics for a rhesus-positive blood type. Now, not an issue for the first baby, because mom's antibodies are going in and going in and going in, but mom has never been exposed to rhesus-positive blood before, so she has no antibodies against it. But, if you've ever had a baby or you've seen it, there's a lot of, let's say, blood intermingling during the delivery process. So when mom gives birth, uh, she's going to be exposed to rhesus-positive blood from that baby. And if she's exposed to rhesus-positive blood from the baby, she will build antibodies to defend herself against that. So now then, mom's hanging out. She's got type, uh, a rhesus-negative blood, I should say. Mom's got rhesus-negative blood. And um, she makes antibodies against rhesus-positive blood. If she gets pregnant again, second baby is where this is in effect. If she gets pregnant again, her antibodies against rhesus positive blood go through the placenta into the newborn and start killing that baby's um, blood cells. This is very dangerous. So how do we stop it? This is not a problem anymore. Uh, this is no longer an issue. So how did we stop it? And the idea is very simple. Back in the day, what you had to do, and even now they'll test you, is they'll find out what mom's blood type is. And if mom's rhesus negative and dad's rhesus positive, and uh, she's pregnant, when she gives birth, they give mom a shot called Rogam. Rogam destroys rhesus positive blood. So if there's any rhesus positive blood that gets from the baby, this first child, into mom, Rogam uh, basically will attach and destroy that rhesus positive blood. What it does is it, pre it prevents mom's immune system from picking up the rhesus positive blood and developing antibodies against it. 
What that means is that she can have another baby, and that baby will not have hemolytic disease. Uh, because her immune system remains what we call naive to Reese's positive blood. That's uh, a genius idea. Whoever came up with this is super smart. Yeah. Yeah. That's perfect. Okay, so again, let me just make sure we're clear. The issue comes from having a baby that's rhesus positive with a mom that's rhesus negative, and the issue comes up after the first child is passed. So you have a first child, first child's totally fine, the second baby can end up with problems. Perfect. Perfect, okay. And that's the end of this chapter, so uh, I suppose uh, there's a test a coming, and you can be expecting details on that relatively short in time. Okay, thanks.